hopefully you'll win. Before we get started, I would like to uh, acknowledge the land. It's going to be a little bit different uh, for, for me today. I discovered in a Humber College tour with my son uh, that my where I am per, uh, situated personally is a, a bit different than what I have been acknowledging. Uh, Junction Reeds exists in Takaranto, which for thousands of years has been the traditional land of the Wyandotte, Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. I am specifically in Adubakok, the place of the alders in Michisagig language. Both are still home to many Indigenous peoples across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community on their territory. Wayne Ng, thank you so much for joining me today. I am excited to talk to you about Letters from Johnny, but before we dive into your work, I would love mm. to hear what you're reading right now, what you recommend people may Oh, geez. Um, um, I just finished, this is how you lose the time war. Um, you know, in the fraternity of writers, there's something you're not supposed to do, and that's slag one another's work publicly anyway. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not that I'm going to do that, but I'm going to be perfectly honest. I, I, I spoke to the writer, um, Amal Al Motar, Max mm -hmm. Gladstone. In fact, she moderated a panel that I sat on. And she, she said right, uh, right up front, if you can get through the first 30 pages, you're fine, but it's a difficult, it's a weird slog. It's, it's an epistolary novel. Yeah. But it's set in multiple time dimensions, post-apocalyptic, but they keep shifting back into medieval future. I'm not a big science fiction reader because I need to be grounded pretty quickly in, in the setting where the action takes place and I couldn't get grounded, but the right. writing was so good. Yeah. It's like, it's like going to a movie with Benedict Cumberbatch or Judy Dench. You know, they could read the <laughs> phone book in German Perfect. And you're just going to watch it, right? It doesn't matter. But yeah. I struggled with it, and I actually had to put it down. Right. I came, I came back because the writing was just so good. Um, and I'm glad I stayed with it because it, it's so poetic, it's romantic, it's challenging. It's, it's unlike anything I've ever read before. This is How You Lose the Time War by yeah. Mel Almotar and Max Gladstone. Incredible. Mm -hmm. I know. But before we get started, can I share your biography with everybody? Please do. Wayne Ng was born in downtown Toronto to Chinese immigrants who fed him a steady diet of bitter melons and kung fu movies. Ng works as a school social worker in Ottawa, but lives to write, travel, eat, and play, preferably all at the same time. He is an award-winning short story and travel writer who continues to push his boundaries from the Arctic to the Antarctic, blogging and photographing along the way. Wayne was recently nominated for the Huernico Prize for his latest novel, The Family Code, and the winners are going to be announced on December 5th. So if you're not already following Junction Reads, I'll be uh, sharing that widely leading up to that, uh, that day. And you can find Wayne and read more about him on his website, www.wayneingwrites.com. Wayne, read for us. Okay, yes. Um, I, I recognize a couple of names on, um, among the participants, including one or two people who said, you know, reading is just so stuffy. You really need to liven things up. Um, so, so one of them threatened to heckle me. And, I, and, <laughs> I, and if that's what it takes to liven things up, Then let's just get that over and done with. That's for you, Kevin. <laughs> Anyways, um, I recognize some names are from down under, so I realize it's early in the morning there. You're either on your way to work or you're coming back. So thank you to friends, family, fans, and those who are just curious for, for tuning in. I really appreciate that. So Letters from Johnny is a traditional epistolary novel. By traditional epistolary, I mean... It's composed entirely of letters or diary or journal entries. It means a lot more than that. Nowadays, you can add blogs, emails, texts, you know, Reddit, whatever you want. But generally, that's the format for epistolary. 
in my case, it's, it is pure and traditional because it's all letters. And I've got about 46 entries. And one of the things that I wanted to do was, was to make the voice as authentic and as honest as possible. You might not pick up on it because I'm going to clean it up in order for you to hear it. Because if you've ever heard or read an 11 year old's writing, sometimes on a line by line level, it's, it's difficult to follow or it just doesn't make sense. Uh, there are some exceptional young writers, but for, for the duration of a novel, it's, it's almost unreadable at times. But rather than dismissing that entirely, I actually tried to write like an, like an 11 year old and I used grammatical and strike through punctuation errors. And so I tried to make it as authentic as possible, but for your purposes to hear it, you're gonna miss a lot of that because the way the novel is constructed, it's, it's almost a visual experience as well. Anyway, so let's give this a go. I've got five out of the 46 letters that I've edited um, for you to hear. The first three he's written to a pen pal, um, which didn't go off very well in that it got him into trouble. So after that, he started to write to somebody that he really wanted to write to, and that's to Dave Keon, which is his all-time absolute hero. And for those who don't know, he's the um, he's greatest Toronto Maple Leaf of all time. Okay, <laughs> here we go. September 21, 1970. Dear Pen Pal, my name is Johnny Wong. I am in grade five and go to Orange Street Public School. And I live in Toronto. Mrs. Clover is my teacher. She said, I have to do a writing project, like write to a pen pal. She said a pen pal is like a best friend in a faraway place. She said she will exchange these letters with the grade five class in Idaho. I am sorry, but I have a for real friend now. His name is Raleigh. He rents a room beside us, except he has the biggest room in the house and we share the washroom and the kitchen with him and two university students. Raleigh's rich. He buys and sells and trades shiny things like forks and jewels and really old money. My mother likes that I have a friend who does not tease me. Raleigh's very kind. Sometimes I want to call him dad, but my for real dad is in Vancouver. It was Raleigh who gave me my first pack of hockey cards. Now I have 90 cards. Someday I hope to get a Dave Keon rookie card. So I do not need another friend unless you can make the new student Barry Arbel stop calling me names and getting me into trouble. Your friend, Johnny Wong. October 4, 1970. Dear Pen Pal, when I got home from school yesterday, the street was filled with police cars and an ambulance in front of Nini Ming's house. The ambulance people carried a body covered up, but I could see muddy black boots. And I thought, this is my first for real dead body. Have you ever seen a dead body? Then I thought, who else could it be but Nini Ming? Soon, all the children and grown-ups in the neighborhood came and they were very nice to me and asked what happened. Because I did not know, all I could say was that it was Nini Ming. Then Barry Arbel came on his bike. He said I must have killed her with my ugly looks. All the children laughed. I wanted to smack him, but my mother came running out of the house and dragged me inside. I looked out the window. Barry was still talking to people like it was his side of the street, but he lives down on Baldwin, so it's really my side of the street. Then mother holded my hand so tight that it hurt. She made me promise to not get involved and stay away from police and to say nothing. Then starting with our house, the police went and talked to everybody on the street. Rolly was not home yet. Mother told the police, we saw nothing and heard nothing. They put yellow tape around the house. I was going to tell mother about the fight between Nini Ming and the cat woman, but she gave me something. It was a letter. She said it was from a useless father. When my mother says somebody is useless, it's the worst thing that she can say about anybody. Then she said some swear words in Chinese that I cannot say to you. In the letter, father said he was good, and hoped to come home soon. He told me to study hard, to listen to mother, always tell the truth and to stay out of trouble. Mother did not let me go out that night. This time I listened. Your friend, Johnny Wong. 
October 13, 1970. Dear pen pal, it was almost dinner time, so I went straight to the kitchen and could smell mom's, mommy's yummy tofu and spicy pork dish cooking, but she was not there. I could hear music coming from Raleigh's room upstairs. I went to his room and heard him laugh. Then I heard mother laugh. My, my stomach started to feel funny. I opened the door to peek. Mother and Rolly were dancing. I could hear mother say, no more time to dance. Johnny coming home any minute now. Rolly reached into his back pocket and pulled something that shined and handed it to mother. He said it was a present for her. Mother looked at it with a big smile like it was a surprise. He holded it like it was a first edition rookie card of Dave Keon. So beautiful, Rolly, will you get that? It was an unexpected bonus, he said. Then she got scared. Ah, yeah, that is Mrs. Ming's dragon pendant. She gave it back to Raleigh and stepped away. Raleigh said, relax, we could go away and take Johnny too. Go away, I thought. I do not want to go anywhere in case father comes home. Mother asked if Mrs. Ming was dead because of him. He shaked his head and said, no, no, it's not like that. The old lady surprised me in the dark. I didn't mean to do it, but it was late. It was too late. I tried to help, but she was dead before I could do anything. Then mother shaked her head and pushed him away. You are a murderer. <clears throat> October 17, 1970. Dear Mr. Keon, yesterday after school, mother said she was going to work late. So after dinner, I walked to College Street, past the police station. I kept going and went past Queens Park, past Bay Street, past Young Street to Maple Leaf Gardens. I thought you might be back from beating St. Louis seven to three. So I waited to see if you would come out from practice. When I got bored of waiting, I went to Eaton's. I liked going all the way up and down the escalator. There was a crowd of people around the TVs, so I investigated. Everybody was quiet, then somebody said, bloody FLQ. The TV showed lots and lots of people cheering in French. Somebody cut up the Canada flag. The man on TV said popular support for them was rising and that their goal was to separate from Canada. Then we saw soldiers marching and guarding in Montreal. Then a man beside me, who looked like Colonel Clink, said it won't be long before the station in Ottawa and maybe Toronto. Somebody else said, frogs don't dare to revolt with the army out. I wanted to see if there would be tanks and aircraft carriers, but then Colonel Clank asked where my mother was. I looked at him and pretended that I did not understand and bowed and walked away. I went up to my favorite floor. It had all the sofas and beds. I liked the chairs that have wide arms and spin around like Captain Kirk's chair. I started to get tired and went into the sofa section for a rest. I fell asleep and had a dream about the FLQ taking over Canada and father sending me on a special mission to rescue hostages. Then I dreamed that some bad men controlled the FLQ, which means frogs living in Quebec, who sent in thousands of frogs and brought me to their leader. The leader of the frog said, wake up kid, where's your mother, wake up. Then I did wake up and a man with a French voice asked me where mother was. I had to buy some time. So I told him in Chinese how to boil noodles. The man said a bad word and said he was going to make a call. I wanted to run, but someone else came up to watch me and he gave me a whole bar of Kit Kat. He raised his voice like I could not hear him and said, it's no egg roll or chop, silly, but it's good, eh? I think he was trying to be funny and nice, but it wasn't. Soon a policewoman came. She bended down to me and smiled. She asked where was my mother. I said home, but I did not really know. She asked if I knew where she could drop me off. I said 54 Henry Street. Then the man with the French voice came back and said, but you must call the child welfare. The CAS, no? This child has been asleep for 40 minutes. He started drooling on one of the new velvet sofas. Maybe he peed in it too. This is unacceptable. He's abandoned or a runaway. He must be put in a proper home. I did not pee in my pants. But after 
he said that, I, I wish I did, and all over his velvet sofa. The policewoman said, no sane mother would, would on purpose leave their son in a department store. He's a wanderer. I got to ride in a police car for the second time, but this time with a policewoman. When the police car turned on to Henry Street, I saw Barry Arbel riding his bicycle right near us. My mother ran out of the house towards the police car. Barry stopped and watched the policewoman and me walk to my house. The policewoman told mother everything was okay and not to worry. Then she asked about Mr. Wong. No, Mr. Wong, only me, mother said. I wanted to chop Barry in the head and charge him because he was listening. And he was going to spread lies again and tell everybody that I was caught stealing and murdering. But then I remembered that you got sportsmen. You got the sportsman award for playing fair and not fighting. So I did not. What should I do, Mr. Keon? Your friend, Johnny Wong. April 18, 1970. Dear Mr. Keon, today at recess, I pushed Patty Bisto into a puddle of water. I know I promised I would be more like you, Mr. Keon, and not fight, and that hitting a girl was wrong. But I was going for Barry Arbel because he called me a stupid thief and a murderer. I tried to tell him that it was Roly who double-crossed me and is the real thief and the real murderer, plus a liar. He would not listen, and the other kids started to chant, good grief, Johnny's a thief. So I chased him around the yard and accidentally pushed Patty Biso. I wanted to wish Barry Arbor would die. Then I remembered Minnie Ming died after I wished her dead. So I was not sure anymore. Then the lunch monitor came and took me to that big fat liar, Principal Ingalls, who was smoking and listening to the radio about the FLQ, strangling a hostage to death and then stuffing him in a car near the airport in Montreal yesterday. He pressed his cigarette into an ashtray and said, what the hell do they want? Damn French bastards. I hope they catch them and hang them by their nuts. I started to giggle. Then the lunch monitor cleared her throat and told him about me kicking Patty Biso. I thought he was gonna yell and take out the ruler, but instead he turned down the radio and put on a smile that never moved. He sat beside me. He asked me how I was. It was really weird because I know he hates me. I thought it was a trap. He asked me about mother and her friends. I said mother was fine. He said he knew that the police are still looking for that no good call me draft dodging murderer, Rolly. I wanted to say, yes, yes, it's him, Rolly, and not me who's the thief and the murderer. Please tell everybody in the school. Instead, I said nothing because I guessed he wanted a reward for catching Rolly. He put a hand on my shoulder and said I could talk to him about anything. It was like he was playing a good cop, except he was also a bad cop. So I asked him what the FFQ was. His smile went away. He said, those are frog bastard terrorists. And then he got all red and said, they're trying to separate from the country and stick it to the English but the army's gonna kick their asses. Sorry, Mr. Keon for bad words, but that's what he said, not me. I think he saw that he used bad words and he stopped himself. I did not understand everything else, but I did not like it. I think he was making fun of people from Quebec. And that includes you. He said to forget what I just heard and that all I needed to know was that our economy prime minister Trudeau was a gunslinger who said, just watch me. Then Mr. Ingalls raised his voice and said, well, I'm watching. The whole goddamn country's watching. Calling in the army was brilliant. I'll give him that. We might get this right after all. I returned to class. Mrs. Clover was talking about the news. And she also said Prime Minister Trudeau had fixed the problem in Quebec and asked if anybody heard about what was going on. I raised my hand. She said it was nice of me to join the class. I raised my hand higher. Then she looked away like it was now me setting a trap because I never raised my hand. But this time I was really listening and I knew the answer. She pretended to not see me, but nobody else raised a hand and I could not hold it in. So I said, frog bastards kidnapped somebody. Then he got stuffed in a car. Everybody laughed except her. She said, murder's not funny. And she should send me to the office for that language. 
But I talked back and I said, the principal said it first and also thinks the commie will fix it. Then I wanted to ask her what a commie was, but I did not. Then she said, well, you seem to know lots about murder, but I think she was saying about what happened to Meany Ming like it was my fault and not about this murder in Montreal. This made everybody laugh again, but this time I got really mad. So for the rest of the day, I pretended like she was invisible. Were your teachers mean to you too, Mr. Keon? Your friend, Johnny Wong. That was awesome. Thank you. Um, you did such a good job. I'm always so impressed when um, authors come on and embody the voice of a character so unlike themselves. That was thoroughly enjoyable. Um, the uh, first question I want to talk to you about, about is language, but before I jump into my questions, just a, a reminder to everyone, feel free to ask questions um, in the chat. Uh, Kaylee, as long as she uh, hangs on, will we'll be there to monitor the questions. I'm sorry for the spotlight differential at the beginning. I, uh, I clearly don't know what I'm doing without Kaylee. Um, so there, <laughs> there you go. You're doing um, fine, Allison. It's not, it's just that they, ha they have to look at my face for just a little too long at the beginning, um, <laughs> but that's all right. Maybe I can crop it out in iMovie. So um, I, I've heard you talk about uh, the language in, in the novel and embodying this uh, kid's voice. Mm -hmm. And I loved it. I, I didn't feel at all pulled out of the story or um, trying to figure out what Johnny is saying at any point, the strike throughs, the language mistakes and um, his run on voice, you know, the, the lack of grammar, I thought was perfect for uh, Johnny's age. And I wanted to talk to you about, about the learning curve in, in getting that voice in really discovering uh, an authentic voice for him and choosing things like versus you to a fight instead of challenging to a fight. Um, it was all perfect. And so I wanna to talk to you as a writer when you sat down to uh to write Johnny was it was he already there in your head or um let me just backtrack for a sec so I do have a day job like most writers do and <laughs> right. I'm a social work I, I've been a social worker for 30 plus years so um I, I kind of cheated a little bit in that I've probably talked to thousands of children and adolescents throughout my career yeah uh, and it's an absolute joy talking to them to listening to them so I I kind of feel that I, I understand their language and the way they talk and the way they construct sentences. And I, I certainly went through a lot of their writings to see how they put together sentences or try to anyway. Mm -hmm. And there's no way I could write a book exactly the way they write because you would have given up probably by the third. You know, because I mean, you can only yeah. push and the patience of the reader so much. So Johnny's writing does improve fairly quickly, a lot quicker than it would, you know, in, in, in for real life. But um, I had Johnny's voice down re really quickly. And as a writer, it's not, it, it's a gift. I, I start with characters in my writing. Some people yeah. start with plots. So I, I started this short story probably 15 years ago. And I, you're supposed to write from a place of familiarity or knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I chose myself. So much of this is based on biographical elements of, of my life as, you know, son of Chinese immigrants in 1970. So I had a character. Yeah. I had, yeah. I had lots of characters, actually. I just had to piece together a story. And I probably tried to do it in third person clothes. I might have tried to do it in first person narration which is typical of memoir but it, it, it just didn't work for me it didn't have the voice the immediacy the authenticity the naturalism mm -hmm. and I think this is where epistolary form just sort of really worked for Johnny because it, it it really brought the reader in much closer to to Johnny's head where you could feel and hear his vulnerability you know you can you know there's a an intimate confessional almost an emotional tone to it Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably why it worked for, it helped me find that voice. And it, 
I think for some people, uh, they heard Johnny's voice. Some people, I know, I realized it, it didn't work because when you, you start off a, a novel with 30 grammatical and punctuation errors and yeah. run on sentences within the first two pages, I know some people probably gave up on that fairly quickly, but, you know, and that's a golden rule about writing, which you know, Allison, you don't want to stop the reader from reading, right? Yeah. And I stopped the reader quite a bit throughout the novel. And he's like, no, there's another spelling mistake or like he missed a comma or like how many ways are you going to spell this or that, right? Well, that's how 11 year olds write. Yeah. Um, so I, I really. Yeah, I didn't feel that way at all. I mean, I, I, I do, I'm attracted to, uh, I'm attracted to writing that's written in a, in a particular vernacular. I, I really like a strong, powerful voice to, not sound like a you know Bronte novel or an Austin novel like I, I really right. like those close personal voices mm -hmm. and the epistol epistolary is exactly that um I didn't feel at all in fact I I probably for the first time in a long time didn't put the, the book down because I really wanted to follow his growth and evolution and he becomes Johnny becomes a really great storyteller through, you know, through the, and it's not just that, that he gets this dictionary as a gift and becomes, you know, better at language. He actually become, he evolves as a storyteller and I, right. yeah. And I love that. And he's proud of his writing and, and yeah, yeah I really yeah. love it. Yeah. Well, that that's purposeful. I mean, it, it's easy to describe the novel as a story of a boy trying to uh, make sense of a murder, terrorism, kidnapping, mm -hmm. you know, in a very eclectic downtown street. And, you know, and I think that's the blurb in the back of the book and the common description. But really, this is a coming, in, coming of age story, not only for Johnny, but of the community and of the country. Mm -hmm. So I, I try and parallel his writing with the actual drama that's going on around him. Yep. So the start of the novel is actually the start of the FL Fuel Crisis. So the things that happen during the crisis, even the hockey store scores, they're authentically and meticulously uh, fact-checked. Yeah, and I was it, wondering about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it takes place, I think, from late September until, uh, well, really, the crisis really blows up in mid-October. But it started mm -hmm. just before that, and it ends just before the end of the new year. So over the course of three months, you see Johnny's writing evolve. You see the story evolve, uh, the murder evolve, the FL2 crisis evolve. I mean, most 11 year olds writing wouldn't improve that dramatically over three months, but it was purposeful. I wanted everything to move in congruence with one another, whether it was his writing, his story, the story of FLQ or the family drama around him. Yeah, and it's believable for Johnny because he he in fact indicates him to, you know himself that that uh, he really wants to work on his writing. He really wants to 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 become a yeah. great writer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the FLQ and community are are big in in letters from Johnny and right. the FLQ in in particular. There's this theme <clears throat> with Raleigh with the principal with Johnny's interactions with um, social services, there's really this um, underlying current, not just of communism, but like anti the man, like anti, yeah. you know, right. control. And that mix up of historical events and personal crises seemed perfect. And I, I, I think you've, you've pretty much answered this, but I wanted to talk to you about, about choosing this time in 1970, choosing the October crisis, um, choosing to have Raleigh, the, the draft dodger there, and how that theme of questioning authority played into in Johnny's story, particularly. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'd like to tell you that there was purpose um, and direction in where I was going with this. But when I wrote this, I, I, was, I was pantsing it. Right. You know, for, for the non-writers, <clears throat> usually uh, writing falls within two categories. You're, you're flying by the seat of your pants, so you're called a pantser, or you're a plotter, where you meticulously lay everything out and you've got everything outlined, thought through, your characters are fully formed and developed, 
all you got to do is write it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the pantsers are you're making it up as you go. You're, it's just all intuition. It's fly by night. If it feels right, you're just going to go with it. You're just going to let your creative juices take you wherever. Yeah. That's how I wrote this because I had this creative itch. I had a character in my mind. I didn't have an ending, but I had characters. Okay. So, um, but 1970 was a very pivotal point. So I, I needed to understand and integrate what was going on. Every one of us has strong poignant memories of our childhood. It doesn't mean we have story, but we remember things, right? Yeah. So in 1970, there were tectonic shifts happening socially and demographically. So the immigration laws had just changed. So we were going from waspy Ontario to what would become you know, multicultural Canada in mm -hmm. Ontario, but it, it didn't happen overnight. And yeah. 1970 Toronto, there were a few things that you couldn't do on a Sunday. Do you remember a few of them? I didn't, did you grow up in Ontario? No, I, 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 the only reason I know this is because I did research for my novel and on a Sunday you couldn't drive. I, I can't remember if it, if it was every street, but there were streets in, or you couldn't drive till noon or something. I can't really? remember quite exactly what it oh is. God. Okay. Well, what I'm referring to, and I think some of you people who are listening might know this, you could not have a drink, you know, in Ontario on Sunday until two o'clock. And even then you had to have it with a meal. Right. Okay. And there was, there was no Sunday shopping until yeah. I think the early nineties when Bob Ray was in government. Mm -hmm. And when the Blue Jays came to uh, Toronto, we were the only stadium in North America where you couldn't buy a beer. Alcohol, right? yeah. So th this is the sort of puritanical, waspy, paternalistic backdrop that mm -hmm. was Toronto. Yep. You know, up until the 70s. And there are other things that happened in the 70s, which I actually pick up on in the sequel. The other tectonic shift that was happening in Johnny's world was emanated from Quebec and that's extreme militant nationalism, the FLQ, which started yeah. off with bombings. Uh, there were other killings, accidental killings, but because of the militants before the actual kidnappings in October. So even though the crisis was over in three, four months, it had a profound and lasting impact on politics in Quebec. Mm -hmm. And let's face it, you know, the politics of Quebec is, you know, the stir is the straw that stirs all the politics in Canada. You yeah, got to peace true. Quebec, you know, Quebec, Canada relations. So you can still feel that. So because of those two massive things that happened that originate in that time, I wanted, I wanted to touch on those. Mm -hmm. And I used those as backdrop. So it became a, a coming of age story not only for Johnny, who was struggling to figure out who he was in a family that had already imploded and fell apart, but, you know, waspy Toronto trying to grasp with people who weren't white, and it didn't go off very well. Mm -hmm. Waspy, you know, Ontario that was struggling with change itself and Quebec nationalism and the impact it was to have on the rest of Canada. Yeah, no, and and that in even in the in the community, everyone had a, a different opinion about it, right? Like the, the uh, Quebecers who were, well, they are doing the right thing, but they're not doing going about it the right way, and and the um, challenges of everyone everyone's opinion is uh, uh, what played a part in their failure, I think. Right. Right. Um, so community is a big is a, a big part of letters from Johnny. Johnny, the neighborhood, Henry Street, right, Baldwin, right. Um, it plays a, a really big part in the novel. But there's also that the the backdrop of this immigrant experience. Uh, the policewoman is described as Irish, and I think you you just touched on this. I feel like we're psychically connected. Um, in that everyone had an identity based on who they, where they came from and, and what community they're from. And the Irish policewoman said, sometimes a country is like a family. We don't always get along. And sometimes neighbors don't either. Yeah. And so in letters from Johnny, we've got the political influence and this community influence. What do you feel had a bigger impact on 
on writing it. And as you say, you pantsed it. So what, what, what did you feel, I guess, emotionally or personally as you were creating the story? Well, um, for, for me, the theme, even though I pantsed it and uh, you know, it was fly by night sort of writing, I, I knew in my mind, I wanted to write about change. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. My first few novels is about change. So everybody in the story changes. Yeah. Different people at the end, even the setting is a little bit different. You know, and to me, it started with community because, it, I mean, Henry Street actually exists. It still exists. I don't know how well you know Toronto, but everybody in that story, actually, except for my family, comes <laughs> from an actual character. Right. We actually, he, yeah, Johnny's family are completely made up, although, you know, we had, you know, I wasn't ready to, you know, put my for real family out there because they're probably listening right now. Anyway, in <laughs> trouble. But um, everybody else had an impact on my life and created this community, created who I was. So um, the street is actually a character in the novel, right? Mm, yeah. So yeah. Um, I think it stemmed from that because in, in the original short story that I wrote, the FLQ wasn't even in it. It was just Johnny and the community. And I ended it after the murder and the disappearance of Raleigh. And then when I buffed it out into the novella form in like 10 times longer, that's when I thought, there's a lot more I can tell. There's a lot mm -hmm. more I can say. I hadn't even touched, I, I barely touched on the zeitgeist of, of 1970. Yeah. And that's when yeah, the biggest event in, in the early 70s was the FLQ, right? Mm -hmm. And how do yeah. I, it's the elephant in the room. How do you not discuss that? It would be like, something that takes place in 2020 to 2022. How do you not somehow mention the pandemic in some right. way? Yeah. 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 So it start, sort of started with the community to answer your question and rippled out and sort of sucked in, you know, what was happening around the, around the country. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was good. Okay. We've got a couple of questions that have popped up, Kaylee, but sure. I yeah. want, I'm curious. I, we have a big, uh, a big hockey family. Uh, yeah. The, the, I was, my brother and I were huge hockey card collectors. The, the yeah. scene in the novel where the hockey cards go splaying on the floor and out of order. I was like, Oh my God, I, I feel that. I feel that. I remember as a kid, just I, I knew exactly the order in which they were in, you know, every time you flip through them. But I'm curious if you've gotten in touch with or if anyone's gotten in touch with um, Dave Keon or his son or if the family's at all interested in reading these actual letters from Johnny. Yeah, I was afraid you were going to ask that. Um, <laughs> Dave Keon. Um, I, I, like I really worshipped him as a kid, you know, because he, you know, it, like oh, in the story, he provides that. a moral foundation. You know, he's a role model. Uh, there's this um, this belief that you know he really is this sportsman's uh, a true sportsman, fair play, gentlemanly, really, really humble, and that's mm -hmm. the persona of Dave Keon that I grew up with. Right. He's not like today's trash talking in your face athlete whose ego is laid all over the place. Yeah. He really is like that. Yeah. Yeah. There, there is no facade. <laughs> that really is the type of man that he is. Yeah. Okay? He's really humble. He's private. He, he's very kind. He's very generous. And that's all I'm going to say because <laughs> Yeah, because he's private and anything over and above me saying would be like kissing and telling. It would be compromising yeah, yeah. his privacy and the relationship that I, I might have, right? And I don't want to say any more than that. But, you know, I've talked to so many people who similarly to me have uh, a belief or um, an idolization of Dave Keon and they want to maintain that belief. And I all I can say to them is, true yeah really, yeah really like that so i wouldn't dare like want i wouldn't want any i wouldn't want his privacy or that image uh disrupted in any way so i'm gonna leave it at that yeah good <laughs> yeah it's it's a challenge right in this day and age we've all got these heroes whether they're athletes or or celebrities and it it really is yeah. a a a like a yeah. did I read more do I want to know more or yeah. can they just exist yeah, as they are? you know 
I, what I will tell you, he used to read and respond to all his fan mail personally. That's, in, that's incredible. Yeah, I, I don't know if athletes still do that. I wouldn't think they do that because the fan bases is so huge and with social media, you tweet something out and you think one, you know, one little tweet, everybody's got to be happy with that. But he would, and I think there were other athletes in that day who would pick up a letter, set aside a date and just respond to fan mail. Yeah. Each and every one of them. It's yeah. like wow, when I heard well, that. And at the time they weren't far, they weren't far away from from having day jobs, right? Speaking that's like, right, right. You know, they were they weren't making the gazillions of dollars they're making now. Uh, right. and I'm sure they've got publicists. We have a whole bunch of questions. Uh, so I'm sorry, everybody, for uh, taking the time um, for my own questions. But Kaylee is still here. You disappeared for a second. I thought we lost you. I got scared. I got very scared. The, the router is back up and it feels, I'm like, okay, this is it. We're, we're set. So it was touch and go for a bit, but we're back. I'm back okay. online. Um, so yeah, we have a, a few questions. Um, the first one is from Henry. And Henry asks, what is it about your story or YA in general that is so appealing across all audiences? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know what? First of all, I think a good story is a good story. And a good story is a portal to whatever world. And it, it doesn't matter whether you're reading story of a teenager or an 11 year old. What's important is how well you connect with that person. And that tends to happen across genres, uh, regardless of whether they, they look like they're anywhere close to your world or any way they look. I mean, let me use another example. Uh, most of us have probably watched The Crown, right? And you would think none of us could probably relate to the royalty and the opulence and the privileges of, of, you know, of the royal family. But really, all Prince Charles needed was a hug. And we could relate <laughs> to that. You know, I just wish somebody would just get up, knock on his door and give the poor man a hug. Can you imagine what his life in the world would have looked like if somebody had just done that? We can relate to that. He needs to connect with somebody, mm -hmm. right? And the queen, you know, like as cool and detached and then as cold as she might appear, this is a woman who was like petrified, right? Who had to compromise what she probably wanted with duty and responsibility. Well, that's something each and every parent out there can understand mm -hmm. you have to make hard decisions that may not sit well with you and you may come across looking evil but you can relate to that story and that struggle in the same way we can relate to a youngster who um, is feeling something for the first time or just looking to connect struggling with friends searching for identity why a is is a good sort of um condensation of universal themes in a common language mm -hmm. you know, it's not that it's escapist it like it it has all the elements of any other story and that's needing to belong looking for an identity um just and and these sort of happen across genre ac across any age group it just so happens that ya does that particularly well. And I think many of us already know that because most YA novels are actually read by adults. I was astonished to see that, but it's mm -hmm. booknet.ca yeah. or booknet Canada tracks all sales showed that I think like 75% of all sales of YA novels are to adults who consume most of it. Mm -hmm. So these are common themes uh, and universal ground that all of us can relate to and I love reading novels of people who don't at all look like me or live my experience and I think many of us like to do that because YA also takes us back to a place that we once were and we mm -hmm. we're all romantics at heart right yeah. and we're rooting yeah. for yeah. that underdog and you know the commonality of YA is a very conversational intimate tone right and a protagonist who's trying to overcome mountains and take charge and and just get their life in order and we love that universal sort of struggling theme yeah yeah no i totally agree 
there, I, I'm, I'm, I have to force myself to zip it. I don't want to sound like I'm cutting you off, but I know there are six more questions. And I, if I start talking, I'm going to end up uh, (laughs) adding to our time. Kaylee, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, Our next question comes from Helen and Helen asks, what do you think is the future of this? This word always gets me. Epistolary. You've said it already, but I lost it. What do you You think is the future? (laughs) I, I call it epistolary. I know it's a mouthful. It sounds like a religious tax. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. it's like one of those yeah. things like epitome, epitome. Yeah. I just always, yeah. it's wrong in my head. Sorry, I'm bungling the question. What do you think is the future of epistolary or epistolary in our okay. fast tech driven world? Yeah. Well, I acknowledge that epistolary sounds really old. Like, why would I want to read a book filled with letters, mm-hmm. diary, and journal entries? It just sounds like wall mounted phones and VCR, right? It's just so old school, right? You know, because I mean, there, there, there's an assumption that with today's technological advances, um, we have new and improved forms of communication. But, but I think really, whether it's, uh, any of the social media, they're haunted by old epistolary forms, such mm-hmm. as the letter and the diary, you know, which are which have strong relationships with um, intimacy, privacy, uh, and secrecy. And when you think about it, isn't that what a lot of social media is premised on? A, mm-hmm. a certain level of you stripping away the boundaries, you're you're playing around with personal boundaries. When it comes to social media, it, it's 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 all out there. It's it's so highly confessional, tell all, reveal all. It's like there's there's a sense of privacy with letters that which which we we've thrown out with social media. Mm-hmm. So I think epistolary is actually a fairly uh, adaptable format for today's lack of boundaries, like. There's a lot of YA right now that includes not just letters, but uh, an amalgamation of uh, text, social media, other forms of social media, blogs, uh, you know, Snapchat, all, all these different things thrown in mm-hmm. um, because that's how people are communicating and that's style and the tone that people are communicating with. And there's some really some excellent epistolary novels that are using those forms mm-hmm. uh, because it's that level of intimacy that we talked about, Allison. Yeah. You know, I love being really close to a character and epistolary allows you to do that. Yep. And it doesn't have to be 46 letters like mine. Mm-hmm. You know, some mm-hmm. of you saw uh, the film, The Martian. That, yeah. That's epistolary. If you read it, you'd know the first 50 pages are video logs. Yeah. He's just, yeah. He's just talking to a video, yeah. right? He's not getting anything back, but the reader's, you know, absorbing it. And then the rest of the novel is all dialogue. So yeah. it's a hybrid of traditional uh, epistolary and then this highly confessional in your face, I may die here, but like a really intimate tone. Yeah. So lots Definitely. of room for. It's good. You, you have no choice, but to be, to be in it, right? Like you're, there's right. no, there's no arm's length. There's no pushing away of the reader. You are literally in the private thoughts of the character right it's completely and, immersive yeah yeah, yeah. No. all right our next question is from Stephen, and Stephen asks when you were writing this what age or grade level were you writing for trying to decide where in my school library to put it Ooh. really good question there's a lot of people who assume this is middle grade um because the protagonist is 11 and that's typically how people decide where what the audience is. Yeah. But to be perfectly honest, I told you I pants this. I was making this up as I went, but I was catering to an audience that would probably understand the historical and cultural references. You know, like most 11 year olds nowadays would never have heard of the FLQ, the Partridge family, the Beatles, Mannix. I think there are at least 12, 13, 15 TV shows that I reference. It means nothing to them. Yeah. But for the pre and current boomers, they lap that up. They like it so got them. It was it was a reflection of their time and of their childhood, which didn't doesn't mean that the young reader also can't enjoy it. And the one of the heartening things that I've heard is 
I've had nine-year-olds read it and I've had 94-year-olds read it. So it's, it's a universally um, targeted audience. From a marketing perspective, it's hell. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> our publicist and marketer at Gornica, are like, oh my God, you know, like they, they actually put it forth for the governor general's award, but they could decide, well, does this go under YA or does this go under general fiction? And yeah. They consulted with me. Well, I'm not going up against Margaret, you know, Adwood, but it's under <laughs> YA. I got a better chance there. <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, in answer to Stephen's question, I think it fits like a number of schools have picked this up so that, you know, as young as uh, middle grade, but even younger than that. And then some of my high schools have also purchased it as well. Yeah. The, and it's interesting. I, I would, I would say whatever curriculum is teaching the October crisis, like it, whatever, I, I don't, I don't know if it's grade 10 history or, or I can't, I can't remember. It's been a, a thousand years, but um, yeah, because that's again, the greatest way to get kids engaged in his, in history is by giving them a fictional story and uh, an access point right. like Johnny, I think would work really well. Um, Kaylee? Yeah, um, our next question is from Mark and Mark asks, I think it's timely that you address racism and I wonder whether you made an early decision about tackling it in the book or in such a subtle way or versus a much more blatant and direct manner? Yeah. No soft questions here, right? Eh? Okay. <laughs> I know. Uh, <laughs> this is on, and Wayne, um, I will tell you, you have broken Junction Reads records. This is the most questions we've had in, in the chat. Uh, it's great. Okay. So um, racism is very much part of Johnny's life, but it's not overtly dealt with because back then, for those of you who are Asian or grew up in, in the 60s, 70s, there just wasn't the language. There just wasn't that dialogue or the sophistication that there is now. I mean, we didn't talk about microaggressions or systemic discrimination. Mm -hmm. Johnny didn't have that language, neither did anybody else. So I couldn't, I couldn't put thoughts and words into Johnny's mouth that weren't there, that weren't authentic, but I could put feelings, okay? So, you know, there, there, there's, there's a number of examples, but early on in the book, his best friend, Rolly, he's an adult, makes fun of Meanie Ming in front of uh, Johnny. And he pulls his eyes back to replicate Meanie Ming. And it, it's like, it's it, it's just one step behind the N word. I mean, it's just like, mm -hmm. if you did that, I would be like completely aghast. But Johnny doesn't respond to that. In fact, he defends Rolly because for anybody who's been a victim of racism, it's hard to call everybody out on that. It's mm -hmm. exhausting, especially if you're a boy, especially if that's your only friend, and especially if that's an adult. So Johnny lets that go and he defends him. And then there's another example when the police are interrogating him. There's some spoiler alerts here. So there's a good cop and there's a bad cop. The bad cop is, actually, I can't remember which cop is doing it, but he, he's like making kung, you know, trying to bond with Johnny yeah, and yeah. doing these kung fu moves on Johnny. And Johnny's like, this is just so stupid, right? And Johnny does want to call him out. He's not, he doesn't want to defend these actions. He doesn't mm -hmm. want to explain it away. Yeah. Because he is revolted by that. So he, yeah. there is a visceral reaction to that. But they're cops, right? So he keeps his mouth shut. So like anybody who's been a victim of racism, you swallow it, you eat it. Yeah. Okay. But so there's a number of examples like that. And then there's one which is probably the most subtle and I'm not sure many people would have picked up on it, but you know, he's pissed at his mom. I can't remember what she did to him. And he says, why can't she be like Shirley Jones in the Partridge family? Yeah. She drives yeah. a bus and she sings. Like she's this you know, ideal, perfect mother. Like mm -hmm. there's no such thing, right? It doesn't matter right. where you come from or what color your skin is, but he's ready to throw her under the bus. So, you know, my, what I was going for is you know, the lack of representation, whether it's in media, just subliminally just sort of works at you so that you associate power, you associate, um, you, you want to be with that whiteness. 
even if it costs you your own identity and who you are. And that subconsciously diminishes um, and reduces who you are. And that happens, that's happened to me and it happens to so many other people even today. Like I have clients that I see who, who are black and they try straightening their hair, they try whitening their skin, you know, they're, they're dressing in Eddie Bauer stuff, which like, you know, it's just not so not them because they're trying to fit in because that's the image and the representation that matters to them. So I don't think I ever use the word race or prejudice at all in the book, mm -hmm. but it's just like class is an issue. I didn't want to beat people over the head with it because thematically it's whatever you want to take away from this. Some people picked up on that right away. To me, it's unavoidable, but there's other people who didn't see that. Yeah. No, it's definitely uh, highlighting as as a, a child of of the '80s. It's the same, you know, when you you look back at movies from the '80s, or movies from even you know the the '90s. You watch them and you think, "Oh my God!" I that you know, it's a favorite movie. I watched this movie in the yeah. '80s and I loved this movie in the '80s. But you put it in in our evolved, learned. I hope still learning. Uh, brain and we realize oh wow we let a lot of stuff go that we should not have let go we, um, we, we, and that that kung fu scene with that uh i i immediately i was just like ew god i'm yeah. glad to pick up on that because it's like there's a lot of subtleties like that mm -hmm. that i know a lot of people miss because you focus on the humor which is great because i had a lot of fun writing this i had a lot of fun reading it but there are some edgier pieces there that I don't know if a lot of, well, I guess a lot of students nowadays, because they do have that analysis that we didn't have as kids, mm -hmm. might be able to pick up on that. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think uh, the young kids, these like they have way more um, uh, insight than, than we give them credit for. Yeah. Kaylee, I'm sorry, we are at 6.04. I don't know if we okay. can... Um, merge a, a couple of questions. Yeah, I'm going to wrap. This is our, our last one. Um, there okay. was another question um, from Trish about what the backdrop of the novel would be, but I think you earlier mentioned that, you know, nowadays it kind of would be the, maybe the pandemic. So I'm going to kind of, you know, count that as maybe the answer to, the, to that question. Um, but the, the last question that we have is from Kevin. And Kevin says, sounds as if you contemplated reading or writing this in a number of ways and you ended up choosing a child's voice aside from drawing on autobiographical experiences do you find it difficult to write or incorporate or bring body to the story considering the dichotomies of very adult themes like the flq crisis murder child welfare etc while presenting it from a child's perspective um you broke up there so i missed um I think an important part of the question. Sorry, I'll try again. <laughs> um, well, so you you chose to read it from a child's right. voice. Um, and did you find it difficult to write, incorporate, or bring body to the story, considering the dichotomy is a very adult themes while presenting from a child's perspective? Yeah. The thing about writing through a child's perspective is um, it's almost like um, it, it, humor allows you to ask and highlight things that you can't always do. And I think through a child's perspective, there's a lot of flexibility and allowances because along with Johnny's confusion and his innocence, um, you can see him ask some most basic simple questions. Why, why do people hate people from Quebec, right? Whether it's that, you know, why why would my father leave? I mean, these are such basic, innocent questions through a child's eyes that probably are more challenging to convey through an adult perspective. You just <clears throat> there's a lot more allowance, is what I want to say when it's from a child's perspective. You can yeah. get away with things. You know, had I written it first person as an adult reflecting back. I would not have been able to use humor. I would not have been able to use dramatic irony. I would not have been able to use Johnny's distortions, which as you as a reader, you can answer that. You know what's going on, but he can't. 
right? Yeah. But he can ask those questions in a way that an adult can't. So I don't know if, I, if I'm answering your question, Kevin, but um, I can't imagine having written this as an adult and covered that much ground. Yeah, I think there, there, if from an adult perspective, looking back on his life, I feel like Johnny would have to come up with a lot of narrative and explanation, which I, I think would have detracted from, from his story as it was told. So I, I agree with you. Um, so my, the <laughs> final question before we do the, the raffle is going to pull in uh, Dan's question and a question that we normally ask uh, our authors before we sign off. And that is, what are you working on right now? You mentioned a sequel and uh, uh, Dan was curious about the sequel and whether it is, I guess this might actually answer a bunch of questions if we're gonna get Johnny as a grown up and, and see a bit more of him. Yeah, so, um... Like I say, when I originally wrote this, it was, I was flying to, by the seat of my pants. I didn't envision a sequel. I actually didn't even want to do a sequel. Mm -hmm. um, but I actually see a trilogy now. Wow. Um, yeah. Good. Well, part, part of it is because I, I spoke to uh, an agent and she reviewed um, the manuscript that's up for the prize. And she said, what's really lacking out there are family stories that are father-son related. And there's this stereotype about Asian dads and sons where the dad the dads are really remote mm -hmm. and great providers but they're, they're quite emotionally removed yeah and aloof um so I wanted to tackle that in my third book but the sequel takes place um about eight years later something like that I've outlined it I haven't started writing it all but this is where the plotter in me has taken over my my pantsing days are done <laughs> yeah now I, i've laid out every chapter i've got a sense of who the characters are i've got an ending i just got to find the time to write it eight years later one of the most hideous crimes took place in toronto so that's sort of the backdrop mm -hmm. and i know that sounds really dark and it's certainly darker than um letters from johnny but he's a teenager now too he's 18 yeah, yeah. He's not just cute anymore, but it is a coming of age story. He's trying to figure out the world. You know, he, he's ready to launch, but he's not ready to launch. There's, there's, there's issues of safety because this hideous crime has happened, son of Sam, all these things. There's still a backdrop. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm really excited with the sequel. And I'm, I'm excited with I am the too. last part of the trilogy because, you know, there's a different tone and there's a different uh, narrative in each one. And I want the reader to evolve with the characters. And yeah. Yeah, it's like, I'm, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really stoked for this. That's awesome. I, it sparked in, in me when you said uh, you're talking about pantsing and, and plotting. I just, I discovered because uh, Amy Jones told me uh, about a week and a half ago that Terry Fallis, the writer, yeah. actually writes 90 page outlines before he even sits down to write, which I was just like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. Um, yeah, well, some people are meticulous. Like yeah. um, Ken Follett will spend a year researching. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's amazing. That is amazing. Okay, we are going to do our raffle. Um, uh, we're gonna do the raffle and then sign off. It's uh, 6.11, I'm sorry everybody for our, uh, our lateness and the technical difficulties. Um, I hope you accept my apology. And Trish, I'm sorry. I'm 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 hoping we figured out your camera viewing situation. Um, so Quernica has given us two copies of letters from Johnny, and we are going to raffle off both of them. If you are the winner, please email me uh, to junctionrights at gmail.com. Uh, you, if you have a copy and, and, or you've already read it and you'd like to gift it to somebody else, please send me the name and address of whomever you would like, um, Huernica to send the copy to. Kaylee. All right. My like new view, I have to like hold it all the way up here. All right. So our first winner for today is Terry Pocock. Yeah. Terry here. He was here for a month. They were here, yeah. I believe, yeah. 
Um, sometimes people drop it a little towards the end. All right, and our second winner for today um, is Loretta and Dan Fuyan. Yay! Yay. Yeah. <laughs> That's so awesome. I can see you cheering in the background up there. That's great. Um, yeah, so send me send me an email and uh, we'll uh, Cornica will get that book off to you. Wayne, thank you so much for joining oh, us. This was so much fun. Thank you everybody for coming. This was a pleasure. Um, we have two more readings before the end of 2021, December 5th. We have Kejide Kilanko and on December 12th, we've got Frances Boyle with her collection of short stories, Seeking Shade. I hope you'll all join us for those readings. And again, thank you everybody. And Wayne, thank you. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.